Since the time of the pharaohs, Egyptians have done things on a grand scale. This is the inside of an artificial mountain. In the 1960s, a huge dam was built on the River Nile, and as the waters rose, they threatened to consume the temple of the most revered Egyptian pharaoh. It was cut into pieces, moved stone by stone, and rebuilt against the new mountainside. Today, Ramses II can sit and ponder anew the lessons of 3,000 years, lessons that still haven't been learned. Tamper with the Nile, and you meddle with the lifeblood of a nation. Battered by blinding dust storms and burnt by a relentless sun, the desert of Toshki has to be one of the world's least attractive places. But it's here, where temperatures soar to the mid-60s, the government plans to build a verdant paradise, complete with high-tech agriculture and high-rise cities teeming with people. And all sustained by this canal piercing deep into the desert and flowing with the waters of the Nile. Inshallah, yani da al mustabal zahir wa bahir. Inshallah. The government acclaims Toshki as part of a tradition of grand projects on the Nile that stretches back to the pyramids. And for the workers, the only argument is who's trying hardest. Bawl lil al arashi ma shat nafaz al taradi. In a desert-bound convention hall, the resident engineer Amir shows off the dream for Toshki in plaster of Paris and cardboard, and revels in the idea of going down in the history books alongside the pharaohs. Today it is just desert. Yeah? Yeah. It's a grand dream. First farmlands, then industry, then millions of people resettled from the overpopulated Nile Valley. A simple answer to Egypt's multitude of problems. هيبقى منتجعات سياحية هنا زي الغردقة والمناطق السياحية الكبيرة حتنتشر حولين البحيرة. For you it is a big dream. And one day it will come true, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> but as its critics claim, it may all turn out to be nothing more than a billion dollar mirage. It is uh, uh, something false because any one of these people, well, if he have enough information to see what is the end of his work and what it will lead to, he will be uh, disastrously uh, upset. We have now pipes coming from Kenya. For the leader of Egypt's fledgling Green Party, Toshki is little more than a political sleight of hand by the Prime Minister. These national projects give his government uh, a hope and uh, it could uh, give the people, and the people are knowing not much about economics or about agriculture, all these things. So he wants to create hope. And to of course, he people. won't be proved uh, whether he's right or wrong until he's dead, of course. That's right. So, do you see this as being um, a sort of a modern day, sort of pharaonic gesture in the it sense is. of building a pyramid or whatever? That's right. For thousands of years, the River Nile has not only nourished civilizations, but provided political power to their rulers. 
Power over the Nile has meant power over the people. But the Nile today is a sick river, dammed, diverted, squandered and polluted, until it can hardly sustain Egypt's 62 million people, let alone another 30 million in the next two decades. It's not only an environmental tragedy in the making, it's a recipe for social and political disaster. I think, and this is a view that is shared by many uh, in the do donor community, that the country will go through a crisis period. It's inevitable. And it's not the big projects like Tushki and Al-Salan that's going to relieve all of the stresses. Unless the country comes to grips with population demographic issues, then they will, they will face uh, some major crises. Peace issues. Uh, they will face, you know, civil uh, strife in the country. Travelling north from Toshki towards Aswan, you begin to realise why water's the crucial issue. Egypt is 95% desert. Its 62 million people are crammed into the Nile Valley and its delta. It was no coincidence that the Toshki project was commenced this year on the anniversary of Egypt's last great Nile project, the Aswan High Dam. A quarter of a century ago, it was the High Dam that was touted as the cure-all for Egypt, a proud boast that man had at last triumphed over nature. But while the High Dam has saved Egypt from both drought and flood, it's also trapped vital silt that once fertilized farms downstream. And the reduced flow has meant the once mighty Nile is stagnating. Farmers are now experiencing limitations on access to water or even shortages, seasonal shortages and continual shortages because there just isn't that kind of flow that is required for uh, you know, house, use of water at the household level, use of water for, for farming purposes. At least one third of the Nile's waters are simply wasted, the result of ancient or outmoded farming methods based on the principle of limitless water supplies. But successive governments, the critics charge, have always preferred ostentatious remedy to the nitty-gritty of mundane reform. The government has to be seen to be doing something, and Al Salam and Tushki are two very major uh, undertakings that the government can say, we've diverted water, we've expanded agricultural areas, we're willing to resettle people, we're willing to take some stress away from the current stresses we see right now in the Nile. The stresses on the Nile are felt most seriously at the other end of the country, where the river meets the Mediterranean. This is the Delta region, once the breadbasket of Egypt and the envy of the Middle East. That's good. Quiesce, eh? Quiesce. Hajj has spent his 72 years on this land. His family, for so many generations before him, he can't even guess at how long. Little one. Like most peasants, the land is his life, his pride, and the only gift he has to leave to his sons and to their sons. Hajj says that since the high dam was built, he has watched his land become impoverished. Now he suspects that what he has to leave behind will be worthless. Amongst the people of the Delta, liver and kidney diseases are rife, and amongst children, 
an extraordinary rate of mental retardation is blamed on the waters of the Nile. In the ancient town of Rosetta, a fishing village since the pharaohs, Abu Shahir approached me to explain what's happened to the river he's fished for 50 years. Abu Shahir and his friends say their catch is poisoned, breeding grounds disappearing. It's already dawned on most people that something's critically wrong with their river. But since the government rarely shares its anxieties with the population or gives much information at all, few understand what's gone wrong, nor why, nor what the solutions may be. But as you enter Cairo, the crisis is self-evident. The choking air, a reflection of the hidden, filthy stew of chemical waste that pours into the Nile. The industrial frenzy that followed the building of the Aswan High Dam has poisoned the river. As you realize, many of the industries are still owned by government. So uh, on the one hand, government is enacting a law to address those serious problems of industrial waste and pollution. On the other hand, many of the indu industries that are polluting the Nile, that are guilty um, and would be normally penalized under Law 4, are currently owned by the government. So it will be a very, very difficult and complex and delicate issue to deal with. Belatedly, a new environmental affairs agency has been set up with new powers to punish polluters. The problem is not enough people are being punished and not enough people are taking note of the law, isn't that right? Yeah. Not enough people yet. <laughs> you are right. So why is it that yeah. uh, they, the industrialists here, are not here, being cracked down on? Here appears the other uh, side of the issue that I mentioned before is social, political, and uh, something like this. That is why not so many people have been punished yet. Even if there is a new political will, the problems are nothing short of awesome. In Cairo, the air's hardly fit to breathe. The Nile, no longer fit to drink. But these are issues which the government is positively embarrassed to address. Is there perhaps no great sense of urgency? Because the truth of the matter is, the people who suffer most from pollution in the Nile are peasants who have no real political power. The industrialists uh, are not the people who suffer when it comes to filth in the Nile. Yeah. You know that all Egyptians suffer together, without even... But the peasants suffer more than the industrialists <laughs> in this country. That's because true, Because we all are subjected to drink water from the Nile and to breathe air mm -hmm. from the atmosphere. But people like yourself can drink uh, mineral water bottles. Most peasants can't even afford that. I myself don't drink mineral water. I drink direct water from the tap. <laughs> you take, drink water from the Nile? <laughs> yeah, from the tap, uh, not from the Nile directly. Well, there are plenty <laughs> of people who've got no tap water to drink from. They drink from the Nile directly, don't they? I, I think their health is better than mine. <laughs> it's not unusual for sewage to be dumped into the Nile or its canals, garbage to be dumped, industrial waste to be dumped, and every other pollutant. So you can ap appreciate what it does to the health levels of those communities. And that's, that's a very high percentage of the population here mm. in Egypt. So it's, tra it's a tragedy. Yeah. 
And that's why we have such sort of high incidences of uh, liver <coughs> kidney disease. Exactly. Children suffering uh, mental disabilities. Exactly. Exactly. You wouldn't want any human to be in the uh, Nile downstream of uh, Cairo, I wouldn't would put you? my finger in the Nile. Critics claim the government's crucial mistake is the same one that all Arab regimes make. It opts for flamboyant gestures like the Toshki Canal project, rather than own up to past errors and listen to those who suffer from them, the people themselves. Till now I can say to you that democracy in Egypt is in a very raw and a very uh, weak position. So in Egypt you will find political decisions and no other, no people decisions. And this will uh, uh, create the most uh, uh, big problems of Egypt because people have been converted to observers and not shareholders. It would not be correct to say that nothing is being done about the Nile. There are many, many attempts and many uh, activities taking place, major projects taking place to try to deal with the complex issues of managing the Nile. Uh, the cumulative total probably has an effect, but is it the desired effect and is it going to deal with the massive problem this country faces in, in terms of dealing with its environmental problems and water shortages? I don't think so at this juncture. <laughs> At this juncture, the myriad problems that beset the Nile have overwhelmed successive Egyptian governments, rendered them impotent by the sheer complexity and number of the crises facing them. <laughs> Meanwhile, upstream, bulldozers bite into the Toshki Desert trying to gouge out a new river paradise, just like the Nile used to be.